now to talk about identifying and uh, monetizing B2B opportunities in the digital age. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I've worked with Oven for a number of years and I come to you today as the leader of a new team that is specifically focused on small business from the solopreneur to the mid-sized organization. And it's part of the discussion that I want to have with you today to talk to you about where some of the opportunities lie and some of the opportunities do lie at the smaller end of the spectrum if we know how to seize them. And so in today's discussion, um, I'd like to suggest three things to you. That the B2B opportunities, which are distinct, growing, uh, not just amongst... Um, OTT providers, and not just amongst the Amazons of the world, but amongst uh, telecom service providers, are very distinct. Um, they are global. And they're available to you if you're willing to do uh, three things. One is to be inclusive in terms of the B2B universe. The second is to become intimate with your clients, which is something we've talked about, but I'd like to discuss a little bit what I think that means. And thirdly, um, the opportunities will be open to you if you become more observant, observant in different ways, I believe. Um, and I know we've talked about um, new types of jobs um, being developed in the digital age. I'd like to suggest one job title, um, which I think will be very key to all of you, and that is to become a digital zoologist. And in this presentation, I hope to explain to you what I mean by digital zoology. So we heard this morning uh, that in the services economy, the way that we produce value has changed fundamentally. I think that's fairly clear, that there are all sorts of new ways that we make money. And yet, at the foundation of many of these new business models are not technology necessarily, but still many, many people. And those people are not necessarily working in the same context as they did historically. And in fact, what I would say is that in the emerging digital economy, we're increasingly uncoupled from a contractual basis. Uh, we have an increasing freelance economy that is both in the formal economy and also informal economies. If you work um, in certain countries, say in Indonesia, or in certain African countries, the informal economy is made up of, of freelancers. But in the developed markets of which there are examples of new business models, they're still dependent fundamentally on humans and humans that are working on an ad hoc basis, an ad hoc workforce. And the cost of that in the long run is something that we still don't fully understand. Now, I don't mean to be negative because actually the freelance economy is one that's very positive in other ways for large and small businesses. And let me give you a few examples of this. One of the things that I note, and that Ovum as a whole notes, and we have a, a workspace and mobility team led by Pauline Trotter that's doing a great deal of uh, work in this space, is that there are new, uh, with new modes of work and new types of work, there are different approaches being used. And one of the new approaches that we see is very exciting and a global phenomenon is co-working. In the freelance economy, um, co-working is for a certain segment of the B2B universe. It tends to be those that are in developer environment or maybe startups. But interestingly, co-working hubs are also starting to attract larger organizations who might want to do some sort of skunk works, trying to do some types of new types of development that are like not just secret, but engaged in a different way. Now, I don't know how your office is set up, but for many of us going into a formal office, if there is still one, you will find that you're in carols. You're ne not necessarily in groups. You are, in a sense, on a production line. And if I look at some offices, how they're laid out today, big corporate offices, and I reflect what typing pools used to look like in the 1930s, I don't see a huge amount of difference, and that is disturbing to me, and it should be disturbing to you. And one of the interesting things about co-working hubs is that even though they gather people who are typically not employed with each other, 
they're actually reinventing what I would call esprit de corps, which is, you know, that feeling of belonging to a group and doing something um, exciting. And just give you a few examples of this. And it's all about engagement with individuals. So here are two um, different endeavors that are going on right now. One in uh, Indonesia, which is a co-working hub. And on the other side is an, a, a virtual endeavor, which has been started up by Telstra in Australia with a major bank. And both of them are trying to reinvent the way they reach out to B2B reach out to different types of workers. In this particular case, they're both reaching out to smaller types of organizations. And what I think is particularly interesting, I mean, they're both valuable in different ways. The Telstra endeavor only started a few months ago, so the results are not necessarily there yet. But the idea of, of building communities is something that is not new to us. In this particular case, it's quid pro quo, if you will, in terms of swapping skills or discounting skills so that organizations, small typically, are going to be able to build their businesses, uh, work more effectively. The other one, which is uh, the organization CREATE in Indonesia, to me is very interesting in the way that they are physical and they are building communities in a rather different way. And also, they are selling digital services. So this is an organization that provides temporary office space. You rent a desk, you come in. But the, and you think, well, that's not very interesting, is it? But think about the service wrap around this. So it's about social networking. It's orientated to startups. It provides discounted or free services, such as web hosting, um, accounting services, some software as a service. It provides digital marketing services as well online. Um, it provides social networking physically, social events where you meet together, educational workshops, and things that matter to us personally, such as discounts on hotels, various affinity groups. So to me, that's very interesting that this physical model is actually making us think quite differently about our workspace. That, and I always think about Groucho Marx here, this is a, a club that you do want to belong to, right? And Ask yourself if you're the way that you work, if you're working in a large corporate, if you feel that way. Now, that is the type of engagement that I think that we should be trying to foster in large and small businesses. And it involves a number of different digital services. So I think that's a way forward and a, a great irony for some of the work that we're doing. So that's about fostering some type of community. I think you have to be inclusive also if you're going to make money out of B2B. And that is, and I've said this before, not to focus purely on certain types of workers. So if you'll see, and this is an illustration even within Europe of how diverse we are on a country by country basis, and of course it would be the same if I did this by industry as well, to show that our workforces are not the same. And then indeed, if you're in a particular country, or perhaps you're an operator in multiple countries and you take one single approach, you may be leaving money on the table by not engaging with certain types of workers. Are we really to believe that manual workers, blue collar workers have no need of any digital services? Of course, we talk a lot about value destruction in the context of digital transformation. We talk about jobs being eliminated. I would like to take an approach which is more positive to say jobs, be they manual, be they service-led, be they low-value jobs in terms of their compensation, can be enriched digitally, and that should be an ambition that it's not just about removing jobs in the workforce, it's transforming them. So I think that you know, if you're targeting based purely on job title, that is not a way to go forwards. You'll be leaving money on the table in the B2B market. And in fact, if you're dismissive of, let's say, the smaller end of the market, you're also causing a long-term problem. Now, this is a slightly complicated slide. I prom I apologize, I was fiddling with various numbers here, but this reflects some work that we've done actually globally, but this is a European cut, that reflects small businesses. What they said to us in terms of digital literacy, we asked them, 
Do you feel that your digital skills, or the lack thereof, is harming your business? A surprising, if not shocking, number told us yes. Now, this is mapped against the economic contribution of small businesses in particular countries. And I will tell you that even in Germany, where the Mittelstand, the mid-size organizations drive the economy with their innovation, with their apprenticeship, which the way that they've actually been a global example of success, half of the manufacturing companies that we surveyed felt, under, felt exposed, underskilled in terms of digital. So one thing I'd like to say, be inclusive. Digital transformation is for everyone, large and small. And just one quick note, I don't know if anyone is from Italy, um, but Italy is clearly uh, an, a country that has some issues to be addressed um, in a number of ways. And that's around demographics and maybe taxation, but a lot of it is around skills. Okay, so um, please be inclusive regarding the opportunity. Now, I'm gonna disagree uh, somewhat with um, some of the speakers earlier on today in the context of making people happy, making people love you, right? In many cases, and again, this is a smaller enterprise example, B2B organizations don't necessarily want to self-serve because you know what? They don't know what to self-serve. And in the context of the next few years, and I would say the next five years are absolutely critical to many economies and many of you out in the audience in terms of your employment. Gosh, that was a serious thing to say. I would say that we need to think about not automation, not self-serve, but onboarding. And onboarding needs human assistance, right? Now, scale is an issue. Scaling that is a problem. I understand, but this is why many of you should be investing in their channel, their partners on the ground who can do more than just refer, do a, you know, identify a lead for you to close and you do all the billing. I say that there are partners out there that you should be developing, and by the way, the Amazons and the Googles are spending a lot of time developing channel relationships for the migration to things like the cloud. Now, our survey and our statistics would indicate that more than half of smaller enterprises are going to be spending more on cloud services. They would like to do that. But the real opportunity is to help them migrate. If, they get the, if the migration is done wrong, the full migration will not happen. Money will be left on the table. So the indirect channel, channel partners, are important. And I look at people like um, you know, the Ingram Micros of the world, the Disties, that used to live on single digit margins that are now becoming, building up their annuity, building up relationships where they are helping their resellers digitally transform, helping them become managed service providers. So, I would like you to be inclusive. I would like you to be intimate. Now, there, are, there is already a lot of discussion about me, me, me in the digital age. I, liked, I, I like when I see it in B2B as well. On the left-hand side, we have um, a campaign that's run by Computer Center, a very well-established European player um, that is expanding internationally. Um, and you'll see that they have very much taken this approach of taking a personalized approach to digitization according to different types of job roles. Um, I was really hoping I'd be able to put YMCA and you know, the village people on here. It's the same type of idea, isn't it, really, though? Because they've got you know, the construction worker, they've got the healthcare worker, they've got a professional services person, they've got you know, a salesperson. They get it. I think they get it. And it's beyond roles. I think it's actually down to something even more specific um, in terms of identifying B2B opportunities, to use a big word that I wish I had in Scrabble but I never have, is kinesthetic, kinesthetic approach. So where is John? Where's John? Actually, I'll ask you, if you don't mind. Um, what is the knee bone attached to? The knee bone's attached to the leg bone. The leg bone's attached to the thigh bone. The elbow's attached to the... We need to look at how people work 
from a physical perspective. I would like us to go back to those days of time and motion studies, which you can still see, but on the, uh, by the way, if you're interested in seeing how people um, count matches and put them into a matchbox and find new, better ways to do that, I think that we need to start being a lot more observant of how people work and how to improve that. And that's what we need to do in terms of dissecting the workforce. And this is only a, a snapshot of actually a lot of data. And I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, Alex Harrowell, who's actually been digging through some of this data, which is actually from um, our employee mobility survey, which uh, looks at tasks that people do with various devices, without devices, whether they would like to have a device or not. Um, which gives us a guide of what type, the value of the task, whether the need is being fulfilled and by what device. So for instance, if you're in care provision, it turns out that they, typically the workers that we'd spoken to um, were able to confer with colleagues, in other words, have an online digital meeting um, via a tablet, oh no, via their smartphone and their laptop, but they would like to be able to do it via tablet, right? Um, and similarly, actually, in construction, um, they would like to be able to do that. So, the, you know, the, if they've got a problem or if you're a loan worker and a utility, uh, utility worker, um, you know, you could go back and, and actually get in touch with someone who could help you fix a, a particular problem. Now, of course, this is asking people with the needs that they feel are unmet. And this is where observation, I think, is very, very critical. Um, because, of course, people don't necessarily know that what they're doing is inefficient. I always have an argument with my um, colleagues who are American about the efficiency of how they eat, right? So watch an American cut, um, and I speak as someone who's actually an American citizen but brought, brought up in Europe, um, so I can say these rude things. And, and, and um, so watch, a, watch them cut a steak, so it's, it's, it's very inefficient. It involves, um, you know, putting the knife in one hand, cutting, and then putting the knife down, transferring the fork to the right hand, and then stabbing the steak and sticking it in your mouth. And actually, I counted the number of steps, steps that takes. It takes more steps than it does if you're eating like a normal European pub with a ni knife and a fork. Okay, so what I'm saying to you is that being observant matters if you're trying to seize opportunities in the B2B world on a role basis because jobs are sometimes inefficient and people don't know it. And so let me get to my last point, which is I think your opportunity and, in fact, your duty um, to become a digital zoologist. Now, um, many years ago, almost 50 years ago, um, there was a book that came out called The Naked Ape. And it was really about observing us as human, as animals, which we are. And um, there are 193 primates out there in the world. And we're the only one that has no hair. That's why we're called the naked ape, right? And I think that's important because not only do we not have any hair, we don't have claws, we don't have fangs or anything like that. So in other words, we are dependent on various tools, digital tools. And so it's really important to go back and study that digital environment see what those naked apes are doing in their particular jobs. Be observant. And also, please don't think that you have to be hands-off, that an app will solve the type of relationship that you want to have with your customer, particularly in the next few years, which are all about transformation, as we try to get people to the next level in terms of engagement with technology, um, transformation with technology, that you need to have some level of migration and intimacy with that client. And those, I think, are part of the keys to really making a difference and growing what is a huge opportunity in business to business. So thank you very much for your time. And I'll hand back over to John, who's behind me. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.